Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here for session three of our webinar series, The Conversation About Burnout, Checking In, Not Checking Out. My name is Bill McKelvey. I'm a project coordinator with the University of Missouri. I'll be the host today, and the session will be facilitated by Carrie Collier, an associate with New Chapter Coaching. And I'll advance the slide. Briefly, we want to remind folks that we are recording this. Uh, the session will be interactive, so we encourage folks to use the chat feature, uh, take part in the polls, and there will be one breakout room in the session today. As a reminder, all workshop materials are housed at the Power Up Your Pantry Conversation About Burnout webpage. And also as a reminder, the workshop is sponsored by the Power Up Your Pantry program which is a program of the MU Interdisciplinary Center for Food Security. And we're supported by New Chapter Coaching. This whole project is funded through a grant with the Missouri Foundation for Health. We do have some social media accounts that you're welcome to take advantage of. A Facebook page for both Power Up Your Pantry and New Chapter Coaching. And then our Center for Food Security at MU has a Twitter account. In terms of our schedule, we wanna just make folks aware that today, Carrie will be talking about addressing burnout. Next Tuesday, we'll have a facilitated discussion with me and whoever shows up talking about some challenges and opportunities as it relates to running a food pantry during COVID-19. Wanna remind folks that we have a slight schedule change. So instead of Tuesday, November 3rd, which is election day, we will be meeting on Thursday, November 5th. So even though some of the automated stuff you get from Zoom tells you November 3rd, keep in mind that it will be November 5th. And I'll try to send a couple of different reminders about that. And then we'll conclude on Tuesday, November 10th with our last facilitated discussion. Go ahead, here you go. And with that, I will turn it over to Carrie to cover a few ground rules and suggestions. And um, yeah, take it from here, Carrie. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bill, for kicking us off. Welcome, everyone. Glad to have you here today. Um, Bill shared these in the facilitated discussion that he did last week, and I thought they were great. So I wanted to share these as well, these ground rules, which are more like suggestions. If you are comfortable sharing your camera, your video, we'd love to see you and see your reactions as you participate. We'll be going into a breakout room. So as we go into the breakout room, I'll remind you of the time and I'll put up a one minute. This will be ending, but keeping in mind the time as we go through. And that's a reminder for me too, to keep us on time. And then if you're a person who tends to participate quite a bit, thinking about if you are, uh, it's awesome, you participate, we love it. Thinking about intentionally when you step up and when you share and if you, that can help get the ball rolling. But also, if you're a person who doesn't step up sometimes and share, maybe thinking about stepping up a little bit more, or thinking strategically about when you step up or sort of step back in terms of sharing in the conversation. There will be a couple of times I'll ask for some feedback. So it will be great to hear you share and just keeping in mind. Um, also in the breakout room too, we want everyone to have a chance to participate in trying to facilitate that interaction. And that we will be talking about some things that are happening in our organization. And one of the great things about this program and that Bill had in mind as a goal was really to bring people together to network and connect and support each other. And with that in mind, we may share some things that are struggles and to keep conversations confidential here within this and, um, and remembering that we're sharing some things that could be sensitive. So those are our sort of ground rules to keep in mind as we're going through. So thank you for being aware of that. I see all of you saying where you're from. Um, my name's Carrie Collier. If you were here last time, you know I work with New Chapter Coaching and I have a background in counseling and I've moved more into coaching. I've worked in nonprofit, higher ed and business. And now I'm working in this arena of training and development, which has been something I've done throughout my career. 
but frankly, I have experienced some symptoms of burnout and that's how I got really interested in this and helping people find ways to prevent that and take care of their own well-being uh, in organizations as well as individually. So um, I work with New Chapter Coaching, as I said, and we work with nonprofits and civic organizations to build a better world by increasing the effectiveness of the nonprofit leaders and impact of organizations they serve. We know how hard y'all are working and we know that you need to take care of yourselves to serve those who are coming to you. So that's our mission. We do that through a variety of activities. We provide coaching, individual coaching with executive directors and other nonprofit leaders, as well as leadership roundtables. We have manager training, we have executive director roundtables, senior leader roundtables that we'll have coming up again in the spring. We provide consulting on a variety of topics from executive transition management to strategic planning to crisis action planning. We've done quite a bit of that recently. And we do trainings and facilitations and workshops on um, things like this or team building using Clifton Strengths or other tools. So we do all of it virtually as well as in person when we're able. So if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to reach out and we would love to, to help you out. Today, we're going to be talking about addressing burnout. So in our session two weeks ago that I led, we talked about identifying burnout. So if you were here for that, great. Um, you'll get a quick review. If not, we'll go over some of the highlights we talked about and we'll go through that fairly quickly. And then we'll start talking more about the causes of burnout, which won't surprise you, I'm sure, but it's good to be aware so we can address some of the causes as well as the dimensions. What does burnout really look like? And then the part that I, I'm thinking that hopefully will be really helpful for all of you based on conversations from the facilitated session that Bill did last week and the one I did a couple weeks ago. What are some tools you can use right now to help with addressing burnout in yourself and starting to work in addressing it in your organizations? So with that, I am going to get us started with a quick poll question about which lemur you are today. So we went to the Kansas City Zoo a few weeks ago. It's outdoor activity. My kids loved it. My son got really into lemurs. He's started working on a school project about lemurs, got a stuffed lemur, and they're really interesting animals. But this is more of a figurative thing, although they do a really good job at just relaxing. Um, which lemur would you say you are today when we're starting this off? Are you the, let's do this, I'm ready, eyes wide open, let's go, or are you? I'm here. I'm hanging in there. I'm just here. Or are you just, I'm not even sure. Uh, there are no words. So this is an anonymous poll. And I would love to know what lemur you are today. Third is I'm not really a lemur at all. So there's no answer as well. So that could be your answer three. So tell us where we are today and we'll get a sense and then we will share this. So a few more seconds, about half of you have voted. Go ahead and get your answers in and then we'll see where we're <clears throat> starting as a group today. Okay, it's a pretty good split here. Here we go, I'm gonna end the polling and share our results. Which lemur we are today, <clears throat> excuse me, as I, as I clear my throat. We've got a, a lot of let's do this. And a lot of I'm here and a couple of, um, I'm not really a lemur. So we're sort of split and I'm um, wherever you are today, I wanna just tell you it is okay because we're in all these different places at different times. But I'm gonna ask us to try to get present as much as possible for today. Even if you're home or if you're at work and there's lots of distractions going on, we know those are gonna happen. But the first thing we're going to try to do is whichever lemur we are or we're not a lemur, we're going to try to start off with getting present. So let's start here. And the first thing we're going to do is just get present in our bodies. So you can stand up if you want. You can sit if you want. I'm going to sit and move back a little bit because if I stand, I go out of frame and uh, otherwise I might stand. But we're going to do something just physically to orient ourselves to the present and to the physical. So take a breath. Think about where you are and go ahead. And what we're going to do is we're going to tense up every muscle in our body. We're going to start with our toes and we're going to make our way all the way up to our head. And we're just going to hold it for a few seconds. So ready and take a breath and start tensing up all those muscles. Start with your toes, move up to your calves. 
tense your thighs, move on up to your torso, tense up your hands, fingers, every single muscle in your body. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Just hold that tension for just a few more seconds and take a deep breath, release it all out, let go. Just let that energy, all the stressors just flow out of your body. Envision them flowing out through your toes and your fingers and envision yourself from being tight to being relaxed and just sort of chill and as much as you can being present in the moment. This is a really quick, easy way to bring yourself into the present moment and to help deal with some of those stressors. And we'll talk more about this in a minute, but hopefully now we're all here, we've gotten present and we're gonna do a quick review of what burnout is and it'll become more clear why I had you do that exercise. So everybody's ready. You got your beverages. You're relaxed, like either the second lemur or the the uh, cat who is more who is here. Here we go. What is burnout? This is what we talked about in our last session quite a bit. And you'll remember one of the big things we talked about is stress versus burnout, and that they're not the same thing. Okay. And does anyone remember or know what the difference is? You can type in the chat or you can unmute yourself if anyone remembers what the difference between stress and burnout is. Everyone's like, I don't wanna unmute. If you're thinking it in your head, but you're the lemur number two, I will go ahead and tell you that the difference is this. They're two different things. Stress is something that happens to us. Burnout is a result of the prolonged stressors, okay? And we'll start with a review, quick review of what is stress. Because frankly, this was two weeks ago and sometimes I can't remember what I did two minutes ago. As Bill and I were discussing, sometimes I have to go searching for my phone and I now have something to help me do that. So quick review. The original definition of stress was um, from 1936, the nonspecific response of the body to any demand for change. It was about your body, right? Stress is something that happens to your body as a result of stressors. It's a physiological shift, neurological, which is in your nervous system, also a shift that happens in your body. This is the definition from Emily and Amelia Nagoski, and we'll be coming back to some more information about this book that they wrote about unlocking the stress cycle. Because what burnout is, it's a special kind of work-related stress from ongoing stressors. So burnout is something that happens. Um, it was actually originally defined as happening to helping professionals, those who are giving all of themselves, giving everything they have, the effect of extreme stress and high deals on these helping professionals. So we've also identified other kinds of burnout. The World Health Organization actually declared an epidemic and put it in their ICD, the International Classification of Diseases as a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. So that's the part about not managing the stress, okay? Um, and then Beth Cantor and Elisa Sherman, they're the authors of the Happy, Happy Healthy Nonprofit they define as a state of emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion. We're going to come back to those emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion that occurs when we feel overwhelmed. There's too much, too many stressors. So the difference is that stress is caused by stressors and burnout is a result of ongoing stressors. So stressors aren't inherently bad, right? Some of them are good. Some of them are things like, oh, I put stress on my body by exercising and that released these hormones in my body, but that makes me feel good. There are other stressors, things like financial pressures, pressures or those everyday work stressors that feel negative, that we don't, that release some of those hormones that are harmful to our body. We talked about some additional pandemic related stressors, how it's hard to communicate, constant uncertainty, we're unable to plan, we're not connected with others in the way that we used to be, outside stressors coming into our organizations, a lot of non-existent boundaries, changing boundaries. And then a lot of juggling of responsibilities. And you all talked about how it's hard to talk about these things sometimes, right? Like maybe we recognize them, but sometimes it's just really hard to talk about them. So some things we talked about are reduced number of volunteers, staff having to fulfill all the roles, concern about staff getting sick when you're filling all the roles, concern about clients who can't show up, 
right? Where are they? How are they? Are they doing okay? Food shortages. Um, as we approach winter, some um, people are more concerned about that. Shifting supply models, right? We're doing more drive ups. There are pros and cons to that. More work to do. We've got more grants. We're trying to collaborate more. So there's just more work that's falling on the shoulders of the staff. Outside world stressors following us in. And then that trouble shifting gears between work and home. And a stressor that many of you identified, one that's coming at us no matter what we do, is winter is coming. That shifts how we work, it shifts how we're going to uh, um, work with clients, it shifts our concerns about the pandemic and the flu coming on. So these were some of the stressors that you all identified as particular to you all. And I saw it, I saw how exhausted you all are. You're working so hard, giving everything you have. And starting to talk about it is one of the first steps because we, we recognize it in these different ways. We recognize it in our bodies, we recognize it in our brains, how distracted we are, our emotions, we're strapped, and we start to have respond behaviorally. So there's, there's these different ways that we respond to it and notice it, and then we've got to start talking about it. So one way to talk about it is to use this nonprofit burnout assessment, which um, Bill uh, sent out afterwards. But I thought that even if you didn't have a chance to take it, um, if you take it, you're going to see where you fall along these four areas of, of your passion for your nonprofit. It's not a clinical diagnostic instrument, but it does help give you a sense of where you are and what you might want your next steps to be. So if you took it, Great, you'll be able to answer this next poll question with that response. But if you didn't, that's okay too. I want you to take a guess as to where you are. So let me put these up here and I'll share these and then we'll talk about where you think you are. Passion driven is the low end of this scale. You're still running on a belief and you believe in the mission of your organization and you've still got quite a bit of energy to do that. The second level is your passion's waning. There's limited resources, doing the job of several people is exhausting. So here's where you're gonna to wanna to start paying attention to those stressors and your stress responses. Passion challenged, you're often exhausted to work effectively. This is where you start to feel sick and maybe calling in to work sick more often. That's one of the responses to burnout. And you might see signs of that physically or you might start to feel frankly depressed or more anxious. And then you've got the passion depleted. Oh. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, and that's where you just, everything is suffering. You have nothing left in you. So if you had to take a guess or put your answer in from the assessment, what would you say is your current burnout level? Are you at the beginning where you're, you've still got a lot of passion, maybe you're not burned out, or are you approaching one of these other levels? So if you could put your answer in here so we can get a sense where people are, that would be fantastic. And just let us see. So I'll give us about 30 seconds. So about 10 more seconds to put your response in here. All right, most all of you have voted. So I'm going to end the polling and show you these results. So if you can see these, you'll see the highest number here is passion challenged. That's pretty high. That is you're, you're coming towards depletion. And what happens when you're depleted is you can't really do much. So you're not alone in this. You know that there are others who are suffering. You know you're suffering, but what do we do? That's what we're gonna talk about today. So if you're still passion driven, that is awesome. Take some of these ideas that we talk about today and implement them for yourself. Share them with others as soon as possible. And if you're somewhere along that line of passion waning, passion challenged, don't be afraid to ask for some help and start telling, uh, talking with others because it, my guess is again, others are with you here and you're not alone. So if we start talking about um, what we can do, I mentioned this last week, and this is one of the absolute best things you can do to remember you're not alone. Others are struggling with you. And if you model giving yourself grace and compassion, it will help others do the same and it will help you. It asks you what's good for you. And research shows this is much more effective than beating yourself up than anything else really to help prevent burnout. So what can you do? What do you need? What's good for you?
And if you can't take that vacation to the beach, right, that's what I would do. Um, but I can't do that. But what do I need from that? What elements of that can I get right now? Do I need a little time for myself? Can I schedule some of that? Ask that of yourself and remember to give that to yourself, because if you're not giving that to yourself, you're not giving it back to your clients. And I know that you all care deeply about your clients because you've all said that the rewards of service are worth it, but you can't serve those clients if you're not there. So think about where you are and give yourself the grace and compassion to be there and talk about what's good for you. As you're doing that and you're, we're talking about the causes and the dimensions of burnout. Now, sometimes these causes of burnout, whether it's, it's really defined in terms of the workplace, um, but they've started to identify other areas of burnout too. Parent burnout is another area that's been being addressed um, as well. And so it's really the same. It's this, we'll talk about what the dimensions of it are, what it looks like. We'll talk about it specifically in the workplace in terms of um, burnout for you all today in terms of the causes. And so Gallup, you know, the organization that does all of that polling, they've identified five main areas of burnout. And the first one, or one of the main causes of burnout, excuse me, one is unfair treatment of work. Any, anytime someone experiences bias, favoritism, or anticipates this is happening, they're mistreated by a coworker, they're experiencing microaggressions at work, inconsistently applied policies or compensation. Those who reply that they're being unfairly treated at work, um, who agree strongly with that statement are 2.3 times more likely to experience burnout. Unmanageable workload. I bet a lot of you are gonna nod your heads here, right? Long hours, especially if you get 50 plus, the burnout levels get much higher. 60 plus burnout levels skyrocket. How many hours a week if you're working? If it's 50 or 60 plus, you're 2.2 times more likely statistically to experience burnout, right? And not just um, how, how much work there is, but little influence of how your work is done and how you engage your strengths and your unique abilities to do it yourself. That's something we'll continue to talk more about as well. The other causes, unclear manager communication. These are in terms of employee engagement, number one things, number one and two things that employees need to be engaged. They need to know what's expected of them to be able to do their job effectively. And they need to be able to have the tools to do that job. And if your manager is not communicating that effectively with you, you can't do that. And that lack of manager support, it's huge. Um, I'm going to let you just answer this question in your head. How many of you have had a good boss that's inspired you? Okay, think about that. How many of you have had a boss that's felt like has made your job harder? If you want to think about that, nod your head. Most of the time I ask that, almost everyone has experienced that. So you know that a lack of manager support can make your job harder. Actually, the extent to of it is 70% of an individual's work and engagement is influenced by the manager. So this is, if you're a manager, you can keep that in mind. It's hard to be available to everyone right now because everybody, you know, people may be working in distributed teams or you may be burned out. But if you're a manager and you can connect with your employees and let them know you're there, that can help. But if you're not getting that connection with your, with your manager, it can lead to more burnout. And then these unreasonable time pressures and people not understanding how long it takes for you to do things. So my guess is none of this surprises you, but these are the top five causes of burnout. So as you keep these in mind for yourself and your organization, thinking about if you have the power to help change this at all, these are the big ones to start looking at. Some of you can and some of you cannot do anything about, right? Winter's coming, can't do anything about that. Um, there may be some things you can do to communicate better with your manager. But keeping that in mind, um, when we experience burnout, whatever the cause is, it has these three different dimensions that have been identified. The first is just exhaustion. It feels overwhelming. And this was something when I met with y'all last week, um, I just could see it. You all were exhausted. You've been giving everything you have. And it starts to feel like you're fatigued everywhere, emotionally and physically. That's dimension one. Dimension two is this depletion. You don't have empathy. You start to care a little bit less. And you have been a really caring person. But when you start to feel like you don't care as much, you're more cynical, that's the second aspect. It's called depersonalization. 
and then feeling like no matter how, how hard you work, it's just futile. You're not accomplishing anything worthwhile. It doesn't, you're just like running on the treadmill, right? You're the hamster. Those are the three ways, the three dimensions of burnout. Put simply, lost energy, you don't have any energy to give. You're not enthusiastic about your job anymore, that's lost. And the confidence, your efficacy and your belief to affect change and do things differently, that suffers too. That's the dimension. So if you had to put out there which dimension that you thought was most prevalent for you right now, which would you say? And you might say all of the above. Um, oh, sorry about that, but I'm going to do the poll and then I'll pull this back up. Mm. Where, think about this, which dimension of burnout would you say is probably most, most present for you right now? All right, about 10 more seconds to give you all 30 seconds. We've got a lot coming in. All of you, or don't know, all right. Ready, I'm gonna share these results. And this one is probably also not going to surprise you, but also let you know that you're not alone. Exhaustion, that's the one I, I saw, I've seen it. And I've seen it not just in you all, but in the nonprofit workers that I'm working with right now, they are giving everything they have and they're exhausted. Um, and these other ones are coming up, right? Starting to feel more cynical, um, feeling like it doesn't matter how hard I work and the work will never get done. All of the above, okay? So you're, score, you're, you're high on all of them. Um, and maybe I don't know, but I'm just feeling all of it. So these are the areas where you all are looking to think about where can I make some difference? I can't do everything. I can't change everything. But if we could start addressing these a little bit at a time, what does that look like? So that's what we do, right? Um, if we don't start doing something now, it won't affect the future. So, and again, sometimes I think it can feel really overwhelming to do a whole bunch of things at once. So today we're going to talk about some little things that we can do, both individually, um, the things that we can influence. If you're familiar with the work of Stephen Covey, we can talk about the things we can influence, and that's where we focus our energy, because if we're focusing on our all the things happening around us that we can't affect, those are stressors that are coming at us no matter what. Winter's coming the outside stressors of politics and racial divides, those are coming at us. And what are the areas that we can influence ourselves? You may be familiar with this serenity prayer, um, but I think this is a good expression of it. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and then the wisdom to know the difference. So starting to think about what are the things that we can influence? What are the things that we can't? Along, um, and some of those, cannot be on our own, right? I'm. You cannot fix um, what's dysfunctional in an organization by just meditating your way out of it. Organizational strategies have to be a part of it. So as we go through these, I want you to think about what you can influence. Some of those things that work may be outside of your control, but there may be things that are within it. Um, this is um, the systems approach is necessary. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in the next webinar that I do, these organizational approaches, but these are things that happen at the bigger system level that, again, you can start to influence, but you absolutely right now have influence over your own things. And we need to move from this idea of you need to practice self-care to we all need to practice self self-care um, or care about each other because if you're the only one who's trying to get eight hours of sleep and everyone else is sending emails late into the night or working every night you know working 60 hours a week it doesn't feel like an environment that you can do that in but you have to do it for yourself and model it and who are those people you can find to do this with you so thinking at both an individual and an organizational level um, emotional and physical exhaustion that's dimension one this won't surprise you. I have to bring it up. And again, I said meditation and mindfulness won't solve all the problems in a dysfunctional organization, but it will help you. And it will help you change those neural pathways that are the biology of stress. So here are the things that you know that you can do, right? Exercise it can be just the littlest thing, just walking for two minutes, sleeping, getting regular sleep. Sleep is disrupted during the pandemic. We know that, but doing your best to set a regular sleep schedule. 
choosing and bringing healthy foods. I know we're not really sh sharing food right now, but modeling bringing good foods and choosing those. Eat the strawberry with the donut. That's always what I do. I like the donut and the pumpkin latte, but I'm going to try to start my day with some fruit. So at least I've gotten that in. Mindfulness and meditation, again, I would be remiss if I didn't bring that up. Even one or two minutes of just clearing your mind, trying to notice the thoughts come up and doing that for yourself and bringing others in. We used to do a mindfulness minute at my old job and I loved it. And then this is harder, but what are those intentional ways to cultivate community by with outside of work and inside of work? People who have a best friend at work are seven times more likely to be engaged in their job than others who don't feel connected to their colleagues. So creating connection, even if it's distance, checking in with people. And then this is a fun one too. I love the, the person she mentioned at the beginning, I think her name may have been Jenna, about the trees and the color of the trees. And that's that sort of fall thing that we can all notice. I notice when that happens, I feel delight. What are those times I can feel delight? It happens when you hang out with your pet and look at pictures of cute animals online. And that noticing delight is helpful. So anything you can do to just stop and say, oh, I feel good. Experience that emotion and be in it because that's a physical response because stressors are physical in our body. It's counteracting that. So these are emotional strategies. Again, probably no brainers, but how can you do this for yourself and encourage these for others at the organizational level? Cynicism and lost enthusiasm. This is where our thoughts get in the way and we have to try to uh, recognize our thoughts by choosing our response pressing that pause button when we want to react, when a client has just yelled at us and we've worked really, really hard to get them what they wanted. That happens and we know they're stressed too. But if we can pause, recognize that and then choose to respond, we feel so much better. It's this mindset reset of how we view our stressors. It's saying, okay, stressors are here. That is a stressor. I recognize it. I feel tense. I'm going to pause. I'm going to breathe out. I'm going to recognize it. And I'm going to choose my response. A little uh, trick you can use. This was um, introduced and then take, it was introduced by Albert Ellis, I believe. And then Martin Seligman, positive psychologist, really started using it as a part of positive psychology is what's the, what's the stressor? That's your A. a. B is what's my belief about that stressor? Do I believe that I can choose my response to that stressor? And then the consequences. Okay, I choose my response. Even if I don't change the outcome of the other person or the stressor, I've chosen how I can respond and that, how I can respond and that is affecting the outcome. So this ABC, choosing my response, hit the pause button. These are our thought responses. And this lack of personal accomplishment, you, you will not feel like you're getting anything done if you have too much to do. And this may be something that you can address, but you have to think about how to do it. There may not be ways to address the workload, but can you engage your strengths? Can you engage the things that you do well in changing how you do your work? And focusing on one task, taking a quick mini break, giving yourself a quick little massage on your, on your neck or on your hand, remembering that self-compassion, okay, no human being would be able to accomplish all of this. So let me focus on what I did accomplish and then taking that back with you. So what I want you to do now is to think about those different things, those different dimensions and what the tiny thing that you and or your organization might do to begin to address burnout in any of those three dimensions. And I know that there are barriers to each of those. So um, what I wanna say is these are some of the barriers that y'all brought up. Our organization might be talking about it, but they're not modeling it. They're telling us to take a break, but we can't take time off. It's modeled that everybody's working really hard. So that's a barrier. COVID fatigue, worried that I'm admitting to this as a stressor or a weakness. Having a bad day, I'm worried that brings people down. Oh, the, the technology, the, it's all over. I'm stressed by it. These are real stressors, right? These are barriers. So we can be aware of them, but not let them totally get in the way. We can choose our response. I love this example of how someone addressed this, right? I find just changing up my routine helps me take a break without taking time off. Instead of just going home and getting in my normal routine, I pause, I go home and I take a 30 minute nap, 30 minutes. Then I sit down for dinner, read a book before bed. They give me a break and help me feel like I took time for myself without taking time off from work.
So that's an excellent way of fitting in some care for yourself within these um, barriers. So I'm going to break you up into some groups. We're going to go in these breakout rooms and you'll have about 10 minutes to talk with each other. And then we'll come back and do just a few things that you can take back with you. So let's see, let's do some breakout rooms here. Introduce yourselves and um, let's see, how many do we have on the call here? We've got, oh, here we go. I'm gonna put three to four participants per room. Introduce yourselves. What's a tiny thing that you or your organization can do to address lost energy, lost enthusiasm or lost confidence, even with all the barriers that you have? And then if you want to um, have somebody appoint somebody to kind of, uh, you may just, actually, let's do this. The person whose name, first name starts with the letter that's closest to the beginning of the alphabet, that's going to be your appointed facilitator. And that appointed facilitator, you get to help choose who's going to do a quick report out in the chat box when you come back. So you got it. First name of the alphabet, that's your appointed facilitator. First name with the first letter closest to the beginning of the alphabet, appointed facilitator. And then you all get to appoint somebody to type up some ideas in the chat box when you come back. All right, I'm about to create these breakout rooms and let you go. Here we go. So go ahead and join the breakout rooms. Welcome back. I know that was not enough time to talk about all the things you wanna do, but hopefully you came up with one tiny thing, one tiny thing that you or you all might be able to do despite any barriers that you might encounter. So if some, if you all would um, just type in the chat, it would be great so others can see, and we're not trying to talk over each other, if you came up with one tiny thing that you or your organization might be able to do, and if you came up with any barriers that could come up and how you might address those, because there's always barriers. So what's one tiny thing? And that's the thing about incrementally doing a little bit at a time, it starts to make a difference and a shift. So that's why I said one tiny thing to be able to address and um, burnout in any of those dimensions, exhaustion, depersonal, depersonalization, or that feeling of reduced personal accomplishment. So hopefully you all appointed someone, you had time to do that, I hope. Um, and just type in, and if you weren't the person or you didn't make a decision or you didn't get there, that's okay. Just type in a tiny thing that you might begin to do to address burnout in any of those dimensions. And then if you do it, other people see you do it, you get more in the habit of doing it. It's one little thing. And as we do that, um, I'm gonna start talking through some more tools that you can use to help you with dimensions. Um, and uh, But while you all are putting anything in that you came up with, I wanna remind you, right? These are generally, most of them are individual strategies, things that we can influence ourselves no matter what's happening in our organizations or in the world outside of us. It's this wisdom to know the difference from what I can, what I can do. And I see someone putting exercise and praying helps me to alleviate stress. And exactly, even if it's not that big walk, I used to teach fitness and I started to think if I didn't do these fitness classes, an hour long fitness class, I couldn't, it wasn't worth it. That is not true. Take a two minute walk and it helps you re address those stressors. So I mentioned this book on burnout from 2019 by these twin sisters and they wrote this book and they talked about um, unlocking the stress cycle, right? Addressing those stressors, the physical um, part in your body where it happens to get to the point where we don't reach burnout when we're overwhelmed by the stressors that are coming at us no matter what. And, remember, and I was reminded they were on a podcast with Brene Brown recently. So if you want another dose of like some serious burnout, the recent Brene Brown Unlocking Un Us podcast, um, they really go into this. But these are things that remind us, again, remember that stress versus burnout really help us address those stressors, okay? Um, and recognizing that emotions are a stressor, positive or negative, but they're neurological events. They're happening in your body and not just your brain, right? We all know that I mentioned the tiger chasing us in the last um, webinar that we did a couple weeks ago. Um, we know that that's a stressor. We know we run, we stop and we catch our breath. We've made it through our stress response. We feel safe, we're in our home. We don't do that when emotions hit us. We don't get through those stressors. We don't go through the beginning, middle and end 
And we are not rational beings. <laughs> We're emotional beings who on occasion think. So we have to address those emotions which are happening in our nervous system. And how we respond is important, right? This is the building resilience piece that we'll talk more about next time as well. But we can't change that winter is coming. We can't change the pandemic happening right now. But we've got to address it. And if I think about when I was in grad school or when I was working in the shelter in particular that I worked at, I would hold on, hold on, hold on until the end of the semester, until the end of a big project. And I would feel like, I thought I'd feel relief. And instead, I just felt exhausted. And then I'd get sick. It was my body's response because I hadn't dealt with the impact of the stressors on my body. So even when the stress is gone, we sort of have to go through these tunnels of our emotions to address the stress that it's caused in our bodies. And that's a physical response. So otherwise, that's where we get stuck. We get stuck in the mush and the chemical stew of all of these stressors stewing around in our body that we have not responded to. And that's where we have some influence, right? Here, I have some people saying that um, they're, they're engaging in a morning prayer or going for a walk, little things that we can do to address this stress in our body. So this is what we did at the very beginning. Any kind of movement, stand, stretch, walk, you do this for a couple of minutes, taking a break between that activity. Remember mini breaks between your, um, between your tasks to help you um, focus on one task, it breaks up these chemical stew. It reminds you that you're a human being with bodily things happening in your body. <laughs> and, and it can be just that exercise that we did at the beginning, tensing all the way up and relaxing. As simple as that. That helps your body to relax and reduce a different set of relaxing hormones that then shift your responses. Breathe. We did this a couple of weeks ago too. So my daughter experiences some pretty significant anxiety and panic attacks. And she had one this week. And I thank goodness I had been talking about this for the past two weeks because I remembered slow breath in two, three, four, longer breath out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It calms your body. Doing this for even, we did it for three breaths, but even for about a minute to a minute and a half, we underestimate the power of our breath. Doing this is huge. It went from her having a panic attack and literally she couldn't breathe to I could just feel her body melt against mine as I sat with her and let her breathe. You'll have those thoughts, they're racing. Notice they're there keep on breathing. Don't let them. It's okay. That happens. Positive social interaction. This one's a little bit harder, but research shows that even if we have interaction, like someone tells us that they like our mask when we go to get a coffee um, in the drive through or you see these people wearing masks, that positive social interaction or a random act of kindness I want you to think for a minute, what's one way you can create a positive social interaction for yourself? this week? What can you say to someone in a drive through line? What can you, can you send an email to a family member? What's one positive social interaction you can have? Laughter. And not just like, oh, ha, ha, that was funny. It's the big, deep belly laugh. Even thinking about a time you laughed really hard releases a stress, a, a hormone that reduces stress. For me, it's thinking about this ridiculous uh, McSweeney's article that I read that's like totally inappropriate, but it makes me laugh so hard. Just think of it. Think of a movie. We made my kids watch Napoleon, Napoleon Dynamite and it's ridiculous. And I belly laughed so hard. What is something? Think about something that's made you laugh and just just laugh, just go for it. It also, if you're laughing with someone else can create that social connection. Affection. This one's hard for those of us who are isolated right now. So even thinking about someone you want to give a hug to. I had a friend who really leaned into the whole hug movement at the beginning of 2020, which was kind of unfortunate because now she can't hug people. But think about that person you want to hug. Or if you do have a person you can hug, Lean into it, keeping your body grounded, going into their center of gravity. 20 seconds is the amount of time it takes to get into that hug. She was giving, my friend was giving 20 second hugs to people, leaning in, hold, hold, hold. Think of it right now. Think of that person that you want to hug, hold them tightly, lean into it and release. 
it lets your body go. It releases this social connection hormone to counteract those other ones. And then you just cry. You cry like that toddler who just, I fall, I dropped my toy, I stubbed my toe, and you just let it go. And I think people don't cry. They're fearful that they won't stop. But if you just pay attention to those hot tears streaming down your face, what does it feel like? Do you feel letting go, feeling that tension releasing in your belly? The physical aspect of it as you cry and let go. You all know that feeling of a good cry. Sometimes we don't let ourselves do it. Do it. Let it go. And it usually just takes a few minutes if you're not giving and feeding the thoughts that are making you cry, but really the physical part of it. And then last is creative expression. I am not a creative person. I am not artistic, but I, I love to dance. So I imagine myself, and this is just me being silly. You can laugh out loud if you want. I imagine myself being a backup dancer for JLo and I get in the car and I put the music on and I am that backup dancer and I'm imagining it and just imagining that has let it go. Some people just imagine their stressors and taking a big hammer to it and oh, oh, uh, oh, uh, uh. that's enough. Imagining your way through it if you don't create something physical. But it's this idea that Carrie Fisher, um, um, I think, put into these beautiful words. I think Meryl Streep said it out loud at an award ceremony, award ceremony, taking your broken heart, turning it into art. Even if that art isn't tangible, what is that? So building resilience is not about persevering and enduring. It's about building up those muscles. Like when you're lifting weights and you hold them and then you let them go and you, you're breaking down the muscles and you have to give them a day to recover before you lift those weights again. Remember, stressors are things happening to you. Stress is a physical response. You have to give your brain a break too. You have to let your nervous system recover to sustain your well-being. So I have an article that Bill will send you all after this about how you recharge. And that's about resilience, not about enduring, no matter what everyone else is doing around you. So how will you recharge this week? Which one of these things are you most excited to give a try? And remember, none of them take too long. Which one will you do? And I see people looking at, um, looking in the uh, chat, people are talking about speaking kindly. Um, they're talking about giving feedback to your teams to create group cohesion. They're talking about um, modeling from the top down, engaging in a morning prayer, um, delegating responsibility. These are the little things people have committed to doing, telling people you're there for them, that you support them, scheduling times for after hours discussion. Um, human interactions, making time for that when we're separated right now is really important. So here's what people are saying they're going to do this week. What are they going to try this week? Oh, laughter. I love that one. That's coming up as number one. And remember, it just can be even reminiscing about that hilarious thing that y'all did together, creating that connection together. Physical activity, literally a two minute stretch. Um, in between things is really helpful. That tensing your activity, that's number two, right? Uh, tensing your muscles, breathing. Don't underestimate that tool. Affection. Someone's going to have a good cry and I love it. A few others who are going to focus on your creative expression. So these are the things that we're going to do to try to prevent burnout um, and to look like this lemur. So I told you lemurs are really interesting and this lemur meditating. You you look for images, you find lots of lemurs meditating. It's amazing. And that, it really does. I cannot tell you how it does change the neural pathways. So um, we're going to look like this lemur. Maybe not, but we're going to look like it for a minute. And we're going to just even that minute, a little bit at a time every day can help us. So um, that's all I have. And then I want to make sure if anyone has any questions, we've got a couple minutes for you all to ask any questions or share any thoughts, but reminding you about upcoming opportunities where we'll continue to talk about this and create connections amongst all of you and talking about building individual and organizational resilience going forward. But first, we've got to address some of these things in our physical body um, as well. So um, 
Thank you very much. I'm going to put it back on this lemur so we can all think about it. And I'm here if there are any questions anyone wants to ask or thoughts they want to share. Thank you, Carrie. That was excellent. Uh, yeah, by all means, folks, if you have questions or comments, Please. now would be a great time to to ask them. You can put them in the chat or you can ask them out loud, or I know it's almost noon and you're hungry and you need to eat something. So um, if you need to go, we understand too. Anyone else have anything in particular that they thought, I'm gonna do that, I wanna try that, that they wanna share with the group before we part? I'm definitely going to try that breathing <laughs> exercise throughout the day. I love that it takes like a total of what, 10, 12 seconds. <laughs> uh -huh. so. yeah. It's an underestimated tool that really, really can calm you down. I mean, it really was the difference in the panic attack going a really bad way, which we've had happen before, before I learned this technique with my daughter and helped her, like I said, just melt. Just don't underestimate the power of in and longer out. I think it's very interesting to think about those little things we can do that sort of interrupt the stressors. And um, Philip mentioned just recently in the chat about the serenity prayer and taking that to heart, you know, um, things like breathing, um, getting up from our seats occasionally, if we are folks that have to be in our seats and taking a, a very short break or a short walk can help. Yeah. I mean, those are things that you have the power over to control and they seem little, but it really is the combination of tiny little things over time that build up, that build into habits that can help us address in the moment. Um, and again, there are these systemic pressures that we have that, uh, that make it hard to do those things, um, but recognizing that and choosing your response and then talking about and thinking about who can help make those decisions as we talk more about organizational resilience as well is important. But even in the midst of all of that, there's little things we can do. And making the time and remembering that you're important because I know, like I said, so many of you said the rewards of service are huge. You can't give that service if you are depleted. All right, with that, I think we'll go ahead and conclude. Thank you very much, Carrie, and thanks to everybody who joined today. Uh, please do feel free to uh, check in next week, Tuesday at 11 for the facilitated discussion. I'll be sending an email to kind of wrap up some of these details and also remind folks about that as well. So have a great rest of your day, everyone. See you next week. Thanks everyone.